The title of our sermon this morning is, Do You Love Him? Do You Love Him? This is part two. So we've been working through John chapter 21, verses 15 to 25. And as I was considering this text, and as we've worked verse by verse through the gospel of John, John chapter 1 all the way now to John chapter 21, over the course of years here in our church, we've seen in the gospel that much of the Lord's time during his earthly ministry has been spent instructing, correcting, sometimes rebuking his disciples. The Lord obviously loves them, right? He's certainly concerned with their spiritual growth and development. He would eventually die for them. However, the Lord manages his time with them in ministry together with an intent to prepare them, to get them ready for ministry after his departure. So as the Lord preaches the gospel, as the Lord confronts the religious elite, Four chapters of dialogue in the upper room before his death, all used as occasions to disciple these men for the ministry that they will have in this world after his death. If you remember, a clear example of that comes from the upper room in John chapter 15. Turn back with me to John chapter 15, a couple of pages to the left, and drop down to verse 18, John chapter 15, verse 18, a clear example of this instruction, this preparation that the Lord gives his disciples with an eye toward their future ministry, an eye toward their future witness for him after he departs from this world by means of his death. This is in John chapter 15, verse 18, mere hours before he will lay down his life for the sheep and depart from this world. Look at verse 18. If the world hates you, listen men, if the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. Yet because you are not of the world, but because I chose you out of the world, therefore this world hates you. In other words, guys, this isn't going to be easy. Write it down, chalk it up, settle it in your mind. Prepare yourself for what's coming. Prepare yourself mentally. Prepare yourself spiritually. You've been given a mission, and you've been dropped behind enemy lines. This isn't going to be easy. Verse 20, remember the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they'll keep yours also. But all these things they will do to you for my name's sake, because they do not know him who sent me. If I had not come and spoken to them, they would have no sin in this regard, right? But now they have no excuse for their sin because he's spoken to them. He who hates me, Jesus says, hates my father also. If I had not done among them the works which no one else did, they would have no sin. But now they have seen and also hated both me and my father. But this happened that the word might be fulfilled, which is written in their law. They hated me without a cause. Now that's the context. That's the context of their ministry in this world. You've seen the way they've persecuted me, Jesus says. They're going to persecute you in the same way. These are the circumstances under which I am calling you to preach the gospel. These are the circumstances of your ministry. But I have hope for you. Look at verse 26. But when the helper comes, whom I shall send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, he will testify of me. Here it is, verse 27. And you also will bear witness because you have been with me from the beginning. You're going to bear witness. This is going to be your ministry. In a world that hates you, you are my witnesses. Verse 16, these things I have spoken to you to prepare you. These things I have spoken to you so that you should not be made to stumble, so that you won't shrink back, so that you won't fall away. Don't get caught flat-footed. Don't turn back. Don't think it's strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you as though some strange thing has happened. Rejoice, right? Rejoice, Peter says, to the extent that you partake of Christ's sufferings. If you are reproached, 
for the name of Christ, blessed are you. Prepare yourself. Don't turn back. Don't shrink back. Don't get caught flat-footed. Verse 2, they're going to put you out of the synagogues. They're going to do this, right? Yes, the time is coming that whoever kills you will think that he offers God's service. And these things they will do to you because they have not known the Father nor me. They hated me, and so they're going to hate you too. But these things I have told you. I've told you these things so that when the time comes, you may remember that I told you of them. You're preparing yourself ahead of time. When the time comes, you remember my words. And these things I did not say to you at the beginning because I was with you. The ministry of the disciples is going to be difficult. It's not going to be easy. This is no, these are no flowery beds of ease, right? The church has been built on the blood of the martyrs. But these men have been prepared by the Lord. And they have the power and affirmation of the Spirit of God. A similar, in a similar way to the upper room discourse, the Lord's post-resurrection appearances... And particularly this time on the beach with Peter and the other disciples in John chapter 21 is an important part of their desperately needed preparation. We see the weakness of these men, right? In seeing their weaknesses, don't we look upon our own weaknesses, our own failures, our own desperate need for preparation, our own desperate need for faith? The Lord has an eye toward their future witness. He has an eye toward their Future gospel ministry, the spread of the gospel, the growth of the church. And the Lord knows that Peter is going to have responsibility in that work. Peter is going to be a leader in the early church. But Peter has outright denied the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's not private, that's public. And the gravity of his sin calls into question then Peter's love and devotion for the Lord. The public nature of his sin requires a public repentance, a renewed commitment, a renewed focus, a public restoration. And so Peter's sin has landed him on the beach in a very difficult conversation with the Lord. In the presence of the other disciples, the Lord lovingly and directly confronts Peter. Look at John chapter 21, verse 15. So when they had eaten breakfast... Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, feed my lambs. He said to him a second time, again, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, tend my sheep. So he said to him the third time, verse 17, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? Peter was grieved in his heart because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Peter had denied the Lord three times on the night that he was arrested. What follows is three heart-piercing questions from the Lord. And three humble and broken responses from Peter. What also follows each question, what also follows each response, is a gracious, comforting, loving, affirming call to Peter to serve the Lord Jesus Christ. It's amazing grace, isn't it? Amazing. He said to him, feed my lambs. He didn't turn him into a grease spot on that beach for denying him. The Lord was gracious. The Lord was merciful. Calls him back into ministry. Calls him back. Affirms him. It's the grace of God to Peter. Essentially, Peter's love for the Lord and consequently the evidence of Peter's restoration is going to be displayed in Peter's love and pastoral care for the Lord's people, the Lord's church. Essentially, the Lord is saying to Peter, right? You say you love me, Peter, right? You say you love me. This is what love for me looks like. Here's what love for me looks like. Feed my sheep. Now make the connection with me. The Lord says to Peter, you say you love me. 
Peter, you're going to prove it. You see? You're going to prove it. Here's how, Peter. Here's how. A life of service. A life of sacrifice. A persevering faithfulness in the work that you've been called to. Twice in this brief record of their conversation at Galilee, Peter is commanded, follow me, follow me. Loving Christ does not mean, does not mean following the dictates of your own wicked heart, the dictates of your own deceitful heart. Loving Christ means, loving Christ means denying yourself. Loving Christ means taking up your cross daily, and loving Christ means following him. Why? Why? Because you love him. Because you love him. You delight in him. You delight in him above all else. And so you're willing to follow him. You're willing. Your desire is to serve him. Loving Christ means denying yourself, taking up your cross daily, and following the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ said himself in John chapter 14, verse 21, Whoever has my commandments and keeps them, he it is who loves me. Now that's often a foreign concept in our world where love is just corrupted and abused. We have no idea what love means in our context in this world. The Bible gives us an understanding of what love means. And the Lord Jesus Christ here explains it to us. Love for the Lord Jesus Christ involves service, involves sacrifice, it involves perseverance. Why? Because you're just going to mindlessly, heartlessly do what he calls you to do? No, because you delight in him. You love him. You want to serve him. The Lord Jesus Christ is your treasure. He is precious to you. And so what you want is to live for him. Whoever has my commandments and keeps them, he it is who loves me. What about those that don't follow him then? What about those who don't keep his commandments? The obvious answer to the question is that they don't love him. They don't love him. They don't delight in him. They don't delight in him above all their other preferences. Maybe they don't just delight in him above one particular preference. They don't delight in him as, his, as their all-surpassing, sufficient Savior. They don't love him. Many, many would say, many would say, I love Jesus. I follow Jesus. The Lord Jesus Christ is about to make what that means exceedingly clear. Exceedingly clear. Put yourself in Peter's sandals, right, on the beach. You and I deserve to be on that beach. We deserve to be on that beach questioned by the Lord for the many times that we've denied him or failed him. For the weakness often of our faith. You've boasted. I've boasted many times about how much I love the Lord. You may have even boasted that I would certainly, I would lay down my life for him. Who does that sound like? Sounds like Peter. Is that a prideful boast? Since that time, since that boast, you've denied him in many ways, small and great, many times over. And so he asks you, he asks me, do you love me? Do you love me? It comes down to love. Don't say that you love me and continue to deny me. If you love me, if you love me, then here's what that love looks like. Here's what you're going to do. Perseverance in sacrificial service. Point one on your notes. True love for Christ involves service. Love for Christ involves serving Christ. Verse 15. Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these, these things? We've talked about that last Lord's Day. He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, feed my lambs. Three times the Lord asked Peter, do you love me? Three times Peter responds, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And three times the Lord calls Peter to a life of service. Feed my lambs. In other words, Peter, it's not your life anymore. Not your life anymore. Put away your idols, Peter. Put away living for yourself. Peter, you've been bought with a price. You're not your own, Peter. The life which you now live in the flesh, you live by faith in me who loved you at the cross where I gave myself for you. Now the three calls to Peter 
verses 15, verse 16, and verse 17 are essentially synonymous. Literally, verse 15, feed my lambs. Verse 16, the word there is shepherd. Shepherd my sheep. Verse 17, feed my sheep. In other words, if you love me, Peter, then you are to serve me by tending to my people, the church. Now, there are three characteristics of this Christ-loving service that I want you to note. Three qualities, if you will, of this self-denying, sacrificing service. One, it's a responsible service. It's a responsible service. Two, it's an active service. And three, it's a loving service. It's responsible, active, and loving. All right? Let's look at number one. It's a responsible service. Another way to say it, it's an accountable service. Peter will be held to account. You and I will be held to account. Notice at the end of verse 15, the Lord says, feed my lambs. At the end of verse 16, tend or shepherd or pastor, my sheep. At the end of verse 17, feed my sheep. In other words, the sheep don't belong to Peter. <laughs> They're not Peter's sheep. The sheep belong to the Lord Jesus Christ. And Peter now has the responsibility. He's been entrusted with a stewardship. He has the responsibility to love the Lord by loving and caring for the Lord's people. Now, is that only a pastor who has that responsibility? No, we are commanded to love one another. All the one another's in scripture are for every believer. How are you doing that? Right? You have an accountable, a responsible service to one another. We're to love one another. Now, all this doesn't mean that Peter is some hireling. Turn back with me to John chapter 10. A few more pages to the left. John chapter 10. This doesn't mean that Peter is a hireling. The Lord is hiring Peter into service, right? From the analogy, the story, the illustration in John chapter 10. Peter is no hireling. Look at John chapter 10. And look down at verse 11. Verse 11. The Lord says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. But notice the contrast, right? Notice the contrast. This is a contrast between the hireling and the good shepherd. Not the hireling and an under shepherd, but a contrast between the hireling and the good shepherd. But, verse 12, a hireling, he who is not the shepherd, one who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming, and he leaves the sheep and flees, and the wolf catches the sheep and scatters them. The hireling flees because he's a hireling, and he does not care about the sheep. And we all know, we know that not all sheep are sheep. Right? They're counterfeit sheep. Some are wolves in sheep's clothing. Right? We also know, we know, that not all shepherds are actual shepherds. Some are hirelings in shepherd's clothing. Now, how can you tell the difference? Well, from this text, one way to tell the difference is that the good shepherd or a good under shepherd beats off the wolves. Beats off the wolves. He doesn't shrink back from encountering wolves. The hireling commends the wolves. He gets along with the wolves. They preach at one another's conferences, right? The good shepherd, the good under shepherd, beats off the wolves, will confront wolves, will put wolves out of the church. They don't belong in the pen with the sheep. But secondly, how can you tell the difference? Secondly, like the good shepherd, like the good chief shepherd, a good under shepherd gives his life for the sheep. He certainly doesn't atone for them. But he's to follow the Lord's example in zeal. Follow the Lord's example in love. A good under-shepherd loves the chief shepherd and therefore cares about the sheep. And Peter's no hireling here. Peter cares about the sheep. Why? Because it's the Lord's people. If you love the Lord, you love the Lord's people. If you love the Lord, you love your brother. You love your sister. How can you say that you love God whom you can't see when you don't even love your brother whom you do see? Don't love him enough to show up. Don't love him enough to encourage him, to exhort him. Don't love him enough to pray for him. Don't love him enough to help him through a problem, help him through a sin, help him through a trial. You just don't love the brothers. How can you say you love God? Peter cares about the sheep. Peter's no hireling. Peter is an adopted son. 
right? You're no hireling. I'm no hireling. If we love the Lord Jesus Christ and we serve him by serving the sheep, we're united to the good shepherd. We're adopted sons and daughters in the kingdom. Let's see if Peter understands the difference himself. Does Peter understand the difference? Look at 1 Peter chapter 5. 1 Peter chapter 5. And look at verse 1. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 1. Does Peter know the difference between a hireling and a good under-shepherd of our chief shepherd who loves the sheep and cares for the sheep? Verse 1. The elders who are among you, I exhort, I who am a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ and also a partaker of the glory that will be revealed, shepherd the flock of God. Same word there, shepherd. Shepherd the flock of God, which is among you. Going back to the Lord's analogy or illustration of sheep, right? He gets it. He sees it. Shepherd the flock of God, which is among you, serving as overseers, not by compulsion, not because you're forced to or it's some drudgery to you. Well, I gotta go take care of this. No. Willingly, right? Not for dishonest gain, but eagerly. He's not doing it for his own financial well-being. He's not an L.A. preacher waiting to get his next Learjet or Audi, right? That is despicable. That is, that is so despicable. These prosperity preachers that gain and gather wealth to themselves because they think or they, they want you to think that that indicates the blessing of God to them, that is a despicable lie. Those are godless, retching wolves in sheep's clothing. We're to encounter them, rebuke them, expose them, and kick them out. They're in your church. You get out of there. Not under compulsion, but willingly. Not for dishonest gain, but eagerly. Not as being lords over those entrusted to you. Notice entrusted to you. You're not to lord it over those whom the Lord has graciously entrusted to you. But being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears. Peter knows what he's talking about here, right? When the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that does not fade away. Incidentally, verse 4, when the chief shepherd appears, presupposes there's accountability and responsibility to the chief, the chief shepherd. It's a responsible service. Peter is responsible for serving faithfully back in John 21. Speaking here, of beating off wolves. Do you see here in John 21 anything at all that establishes papal authority for Peter? No, neither do I. It's not there, all right? So the loving service that Peter is called to is a responsible service. Number two, it's an active service. It's an active service. Notice next, fairly in simple Straightforward observation of the text. Serving Christ in his church, John chapter 21, 15, 16, 17, is described by verbs and not nouns. Right? These are verbs. Feed, tend, shepherd. In other words, the Lord is not calling Peter to a title. Pope. He's calling Peter to action. He's calling Peter to action. Peter's not to be seated in an ivory tower looking down the end of his nose at the sheep. He's down with the sheep. He's in the dirt with the sheep. He's one of them. He's caring for them, beating off wolves. The hireling just likes to talk once a week, likes to hear the sound of his own voice, likes the sound of his own voice. A hireling may do a thousand other things in the church just to avoid the sheep. I remember hearing a while back, we chuckle about it now and then, but uh, it really is sad. It's not funny. Someone said that ministry would be great if it weren't for all these people. <laughs> ministry is the people, right? Feed my sheep, care for my sheep, tend my sheep. And you may say, again, you know, what about me? I'm not a pastor. Jesus would ask you, do you love me? Do you love me? And tend to my sheep. Verbs not nouns. Verbs, not nouns. Verbs, not the hypocritical, empty platitudes 
of goats. Verbs. I love the brothers. Well, then why do you abandon them? I love the brothers. I love the sisters. Then why do you slander them? Why do you betray them? Why do you leave them in times of difficulty, in times of trial? What does love for the brothers look like? What does love look like? It looks like action. It looks like action. Love them. Speaking of that then, number three, it's a loving service. One, it's a responsible service. Two, it's an active service. Three, it's a loving service. Prior to each statement of commission, feed my sheep, is the question of our love for the Lord Jesus Christ. Do you love me? Love is the prerequisite for service. It's a requirement. It's the necessity for service. Now, last week, we discussed these opening verses from the perspective of Peter's love for Christ. And that's certainly appropriate, right? The Lord is calling into question Peter's love for him. In light of Peter's denials, the Lord is asking him, do you love me, Peter? But what is to motivate or compel Peter's love? Does that love just sort of spring out of our own heart? No. (laughs) We have hearts that don't effuse love in that way. What motivates or compels our love? What motivates or compels our service? In other words, we love him. Why? That's right, because he first loved us. We love him because he first loved us. Turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, Paul, who loves the Corinthians because he is a good under-shepherd of his chief shepherd, Paul is discussing his labor for the Lord among the Corinthians. Look at his description of this labor at verse 9. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 9. Therefore, Paul says, we make it our aim, whether present or absent, to be well-pleasing to him. To whom? The Lord Jesus Christ. Well-pleasing to the Lord Jesus Christ. Why, Why Paul? Verse 10. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. It is a responsible, accountable service. Paul, in his labor among the Lord's chief sheep, is singularly focused on being well-pleasing to the Lord. When you love your brother, when you love your sister, when you serve the, ch- the church, your aim is to be well-pleasing to him. So when you come in on a Sunday morning and you drudge, ah, oh, I gotta go in that room. Is that well-pleasing to the Lord? (laughs) Serving among God's people, even miniature-sized people, is to be done with an aim to pleasing Him. We make it our aim, whether present or absent, to be well-pleasing to Him. Paul, in his labor among the Lord's sheep, singularly focused on being well-pleasing to the Lord, knowing that one day he's going to give an account for that work. We must all, verse 10, appear before the judgment seat of Christ. He was so singularly focused, in fact, that worldly lost people would have and did think that Paul was mentally unhinged. Drop down to verse 13. Verse 13. For if we are beside ourselves, it is for God. Or if we are of sound mind, it is for you. Paul was so committed, so passionate, so zealous about the gospel and about the Corinthians, about the Lord Jesus Christ, that one of the charges made by false teachers against Paul was that he was out of his mind. He was out of his mind. Paul, you're beside yourself, right? Paul was fanatical to them. If Paul was a one-man church, they would have called him a cult. (laughs) <laughs> because Paul was serious about following. You know, interesting, isn't it? As soon as, you get uh, as soon as you get serious about following the Lord, you're a fanatic all of a sudden. I just want to love the Lord. I want to obey Him. And as soon as you express love for the Lord that demonstrates in obedience, you're a fanatical person. You're mentally unhinged. If a church is characterized in that way by a bunch of people who love the Lord getting together and serving Him, all of a sudden that church is a cult. There have been people who call this church a cult that haven't even walked in the front doors of this building, who've never listened to a single sermon. 
But because the people here are zealous for the Lord, obviously it's something's wrong. Something's wrong with that place. You know, something's wrong with you. The Roman governor Festus said, Paul, you are out of your mind. Much learning has made you mad. <laughs> Paul essentially says, listen, it's of no consequence to me what you think. If I'm zealous, if I'm passionate, if I preach Christ with conviction, it's for God. If we preach with conviction, it's for God. Even if I'm out of my mind, as you say, it's for the sake of God's truth and the sake of your soul. I'll play the fool. But why would you do this, Paul? What drives you? What, dri what motivates you, Paul, to do that? What motivates you to play the fool? The foolishness of preaching. What motivates you? Your zeal, your passion, your conviction. What drives you, Paul? Verse 14, for the love of Christ compels us because we judge thus that if one died for all, then all died. And he died for all that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. Amen. Certainly Paul's love for Christ motivated him, right? Paul's love for Christ motivated him. It drove him to serve Christ with zeal. He loved the Lord, right? Certainly your love for Christ motivates you. It may be your lack of love or the coolness of your love or you losing your first love that keeps you from serving Christ with zeal, but what motivated or compelled Paul's love? It was Christ's love for him. We love him because he first loved us. Christ's sacrificial, matchless, incomprehensible, overwhelming love compelled. The word there means controlled. It controlled Paul. And Paul served the Lord as a, a grateful, loving act of worship and praise for the Lord Jesus Christ. If Christ has died, verse 14, if one died for all, then all died. If Christ has died for all believers, then all believers die in Christ. What does that mean? That means they should no longer live for themselves. If Christ has died for all believers, then all believers, all those who put their faith and trust in Christ, listen, if you say, I'm tired of my life, I don't want to live that way anymore, I don't want to have anything to do with my sin anymore, I'm sick and tired of it, I want to leave that life, I want Christ, I want forgiveness, I want heaven. If you say that, then you die in Him. You come and you die in Him. If Christ has died for all believers, then all believers die in Christ. That means they should no longer live for themselves. Stop living for yourself. Stop living for your sin. Stop making provision for the flesh. Stop enjoying worldly lusts. You should live for him who died for you and rose again. That's what compelled Paul's love, Paul's service. It's a loving service. Back in John 21. The love of Christ compels us, both our love for him, but certainly, preeminently, his love for us. Love is the fountain spring, fruit of the Spirit, motivation for gospel ministry. And this is so important, so important. Following Christ is so far from merely doing good things that he commands or simply avoiding bad things that he condemns, it is a matter, it is a matter, following Christ is a matter of loving the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength, all the time. It is a matter of loving the Lord. It's a matter of delighting to do those things that he gives you to do because he loved you and because he gave himself for you, that you could be saved, that you could be forgiven of your sin, that you could be with him in heaven one day, fleeing the wrath of God. 
And Jesus says, if anyone loves me, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word. Paul told the Corinthians, right, you, you consider the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ, what Christ has done. You consider that for a moment. This motivated Paul to tell the Corinthians, if anyone does not love the Lord Jesus Christ, let him be damned. Considering the worthiness of Christ for that love, the value, the preciousness, the excellency of the Lord Jesus Christ. If you don't love the Lord Jesus Christ, then be damned. Love the Lord. And that's exactly what happens in Scripture. If you don't love the Lord Jesus Christ, you are damned. You'll perish. All of that, all of that is only possible in the Spirit of God, with the Spirit of God. To follow Him, to love Him, to serve Him in that way. It's the Spirit of God, right? Paul also says, that sheds abroad in our hearts a love for God, right? The Spirit does that. The love of God for us, our love for Him. Point one on your notes, true love for Christ involves service. Secondly, point two on your notes, true love for Christ involves sacrifice. Involves sacrifice. Look at John chapter 21, verse 18. Most assuredly, literally there, amen, amen. This is emphatic. Jesus is saying, listen to me carefully. Most assuredly, I say to you, Peter, when you were younger, you girded yourself and walked where you wished. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and another will gird you and carry you where you do not wish. This he spoke, verse 19, signifying by what death he would glorify God. When he had spoken this, he said to him, follow me. Jesus says, you've been bought with a price, Peter. You are not your own, Peter. You have been called into loving service, and it's a service that will demand everything from you, even your own life. Amen. Amen. Most assuredly, Listen to me, Peter, you are going to deny yourself even unto death for me. The Lord, in communicating to this, this to Peter, employs a contrast. Employs a contrast between Peter when he was younger, before Christ, when he lived life for himself, and Peter when he is old, where even his death will be a sacrifice to the glory of God. When you were younger, you girded yourself. You walked where you wished. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands, and another will gird you and carry you where you do not wish. Stretch out your hands, widely used as a figure of speech to refer to crucifixion. Crucifixion. Another will come along and gird Peter along the shoulders with the cross beam of his own cross. And another will, Pharaoh, will bear you or will bring you to the place of execution. Now, that understanding is confirmed by verse 19. This he spoke signifying by what death he, Peter, would glorify God. Now, Peter knew what the Lord was talking about. This was clear to Peter. Did Peter love the Lord? Yes, he did. Did Peter find Christ worthy of? of his life, and even worthy of his death. Yes, he did. Peter would, in fact, later be crucified for preaching Christ. His life poured out as an offering of love to the Lord Jesus Christ. It's interesting, as we think about verses 18 and 19 here, it's interesting to think of how Peter would have taken this news. You're going to die for me, Peter. You're going to die. You're going to, you're going to be crucified. You're going to be led to the place of execution where you do not wish, and you will die for me. How did Peter take that? After Peter's prideful boasting, right? After his empty, fleshly confidence that he boasted in before the Lord's death. After that experience, I think Peter, hearing this from the Lord, that Peter's heart would have leapt with joy. <laughs> a humble joy, a sober joy. But I think that Peter would have rejoiced in knowing this. Peter might have thought, 
You know, I denied you in the past. I denied you in the past, but I'll not deny you again. When that time comes, I'll pay the price. I'll glorify you. And I'm going to die. By the grace of God, when I finish my race, when I face death again for the last time, I'm going out preaching Christ in victory. I think that's what Peter would have thought. I think that Peter lived and served the Lord in constant light of this sovereign promise from the Lord Jesus Christ. Let me give you an example. Look at Acts chapter 4, a couple of pages to the left, or to the right, your other left. Acts chapter 4. I think that Peter lived, served the Lord in light of this promise. Acts chapter 4. And look down at verse 8. Peter and John, Peter and John heal a lame man in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ at the gate beautiful going into the temple, right? Peter then in the temple preaches boldly from the Old Testament, preaches the Lord Jesus Christ. Preaching in the temple, Peter and John are arrested by the priests. Now notice this. This is the beginning of Acts 3. They're arrested by the priests, the Sadducees, the captain of the temple, very likely the same men, many of the same men who arrested Christ in the garden or arresting Peter and John. They're brought before the Sanhedrin. They're brought before Annas. They're brought before Caiaphas, the high priest. All this sound familiar? Peter in faith has got to be thinking, right? My life is in the Lord's hands. I don't know exactly when I'm going out, but it looks like this may be it. And I'm going out preaching Christ. So here goes Peter, verse 8. Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, he said to Annas, Caiaphas, the high priest, he addressed the Sanhedrin, the captain of the temple guard, the Sadducees. He said to them, rulers of the people and elders of Israel, if we this day are judged for a good deed done to a helpless man, by what means he has been made well, let it be known to you all and to all the people of Israel. In other words, I'm not going to stop preaching this. I'm going to make it known to everybody. That by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, you murderers, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man stands here before you whole. This is the stone which was rejected by you builders, which has become the chief cornerstone. Nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Amen, Peter. That's boldness. Amen? And when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, verse 13, and perceived that they were uneducated and untrained men, they marveled, and they realized that they had been with Jesus. Drop down to verse 18. So they called them, and they commanded them not to speak at all, nor teach in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John, they cowered in fear. No, they didn't. <laughs> answered and said to them, whether it's right in the sight of God to listen to you more than to God, you judge. For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. Why? It's compelled by the love of Christ. An understanding of the resurrection, the life of Christ, the sacrifice of Christ, the death of Christ, the atonement of Christ. Understanding these things now in the power of the Spirit, the Spirit of God indwelling them. Peter says, we cannot but speak. Can't help it. We are compelled. We will speak. We will serve. We cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. And you understand, this is a sacrificial service. They're in front of the very men that murdered the Lord Jesus Christ. What's to keep them from doing it right now to Peter and John? Verse 21. So when they had further threatened them, they let them go, finding no way of punishing them. Why? Because they accepted the truth and they understood. No. Because of the people. <laughs> because of the people. Since they all glorified God for what, he had, what had been done. They all knew this lame man had been healed. Healed in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. So that when Peter, when John preached in the temple, their words attested to by God with signs and wonders. Right? Until the canon is closed. 
God attests to the veracity and efficacy of his word through miracles, through healing. Here, the people had seen it. They knew that they were from God, and they all glorified God for what had been done. Verse 22, for the man was over 40 years old on whom this miracle of healing had been performed. Peter is arrested again, beaten again, and released in Acts chapter 5. Stephen is murdered in Acts chapter 7. The Jews plotted to kill Paul in Acts chapter 9. Flip over to Acts chapter 12. Acts chapter 12. Again, Peter's service is a sacrificial service. You know, your service, my service, needs to be a sacrificial service. We may follow Peter, serving the Lord Jesus Christ to our deaths. If not to our deaths, let it be in daily denying of yourself, picking up your cross, and following him. Right? Our service is a sacrificial service. It's a service that requires that you deny yourself. Peter denied himself to death. Acts chapter 12, look at verse 1. Now about that time, Herod the king, we know that snake, right? That fox, Herod. Herod the king stretched out his hand to harass some from the church. Then he killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. Herod killed him. And because he saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded further to seize Peter also. Now what was he going to do with Peter? He was going to kill Peter the way that he killed James. It pleased the Jews, and so he proceeded further to seize Peter also. Now it was during the days of unleavened bread, verse 4. So when he had arrested him, he put him in prison and delivered him to four squads of soldiers to keep him, intending to bring him before the people after Passover. Now Peter has got to be thinking, okay, this is it. <laughs> this is how I'm going out, right? Herod's already killed James. I think this may be how I'm going out. The Lord said it would be when I was old. Maybe he just meant older, right? He's like, I'm not sure. It just doesn't, this doesn't look right. I think this is how I'm going out. Verse 5, Peter was therefore kept in prison, but constant prayer was offered by God or to God for him by the church. And when Herod was about to bring him out, that night, Peter, what was he doing? <laughs> Peter was sleeping. And that speaks volumes, doesn't it? Herod's about to bring him out. For what purpose? To kill him? Peter's sleeping. He just had... This is, this is faith. <laughs> this is Peter entrusting himself to the Lord. Peter, having committed himself to him in doing good, Peter is faithful, obedient, courageous, bold, assured, content, joyful, and restful, at peace, <laughs> bold. He was sleeping, bound with two chains between two soldiers, and the guards before the door were keeping the prison. Look at 1 Peter chapter 4. 1 Peter chapter 4. Peter would later write to the beleaguered and persecuted Christians of the dispersion in 1 Peter And in 1 Peter chapter 4, drop down to verse 12 with me. Peter understood God's sovereignty, understood that his life was in the hands of the Lord. You know, that, that promise that the Lord gave Peter on the beach that day, when you're old, you're going to stretch out your hands. Someone else is going to guard you. They're going to lead you where you don't wish. That promise given by the Lord... Peter living in light of that promise, really we should live in the light of that understanding also, shouldn't we? That God is sovereign. Your life is in his hands. Your days are numbered. They are fashioned for you when as yet there were none of them. So what is it that prevents us from preaching with the same boldness as Peter? Living for Christ with the same confidence we get so worried sometimes, don't we? So tied up, so anxious, so fearful. Peter is sleeping, resting peacefully in prison <laughs> under Herod. 
Peter says in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 12, in light of all this, right? This fueling Peter's understanding, he says, Beloved, do not think it strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you as though some strange thing happened to you. But rejoice to the extent that you partake of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory is revealed, you may also be glad with exceeding joy. If you are reproached for the name of Christ, blessed are you. For the spirit of glory of God and of God rests upon you. On their part, he's blasphemed. But on your part, he is glorified. But let none of you suffer as a murderer, as a thief, an evildoer, or as a busybody in other people's matters. Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, in other words, not if you suffer as a jerk, or if you suffer as a mean-spirited, right? And they, we're not talking about that. If anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in this matter. For the time has come for judgment to begin at the house of God. And if it begins with us first, if we must endure those kinds of trials, those kinds of difficulties, that adversity, then what will be the end of those who do not obey the gospel of God? Now, if the righteous one is scarcely saved, where will the ungodly and the sinner appear? Therefore, let those who suffer according to the will of God, here it is, commit their souls to him in doing good as to a faithful creator. We see that in the example of Peter. Peter wasn't morbidly preoccupied with the future. Wasn't, more, when's it going to be, right? And just you know, paralyzed by fear or no. Peter made it his aim, understanding that, understanding that Peter made it his aim to be faithful to the Lord in the present. Each circumstance that comes up, Peter, how can I respond faithfully, 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 boldly, in confidence, in faith, right? Every circumstance that comes up, trusting the Lord in sacrificial service. This may not be easy. This may not be pleasant. There may be pain involved, but I'm going to be faithful to the Lord knowing that my, my life is in his hands, right? I've committed my soul to him in doing good. I've committed my soul to him in watching televangelists on Sunday morning instead of coming to church. No. I've committed my soul to him. I'm just going to show up once a week and then go back to my life as I normally. No. <laughs> committed your soul to him in doing good as to a faithful creator. Back in John 21. The Lord ends, verse 19, verse 19, with the first of two imperative commands to Peter. Follow me. Follow me. Present, active, imperative. Ongoing, undeterred, faithful obedience. That's what that means. The call to Christ is a call to discipleship. The call to salvation is a call to follow Christ. Follow me, Jesus says. Present, active, here imperative. Present, active, indicative. An ongoing, undeterred, faithful obedience. Day by day, hour by hour, minute by minute. This is not going to be a walk on the beach. Right? This is not going to be easy. All who des desire to live godly in this present age will suffer persecution. But you are to follow him. Do you love him? Then follow him. 1 John chapter 3, verse 18. John would write later, My little children, let us not love in word or in tongue, but in deed and in truth. And by this we know that we are of the truth and shall assure our hearts before him. You want to assure your heart that you're in Christ? You want to assure your heart that you have fellowship with God, communion with the Lord Jesus Christ? Then follow him. Follow him in responsible, active, loving, sacrificial service. Follow the Lord and you'll assure your heart before him. By the time that John writes this gospel, Peter is dead. Peter made it to the end, right? Crucified in Rome under Nero. So what will be your end? What will be my end? Will you go out faithful to the Lord, serving to the very end, steadfast, immovable, knowing that your work in the Lord, your labor for him is not in vain? Are you serving him faithfully now? Do you love him? Listen to the words of Jesus in John chapter 12, verse 25. He who loves his life will lose it. If you love your life, 
you will lose it. And he who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Let that sink in. Meditate on that thought. He who loves his life will lose it. He who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. If anyone serves me, let him follow me. And where I am, there my servant will be also. Look forward to that. If anyone serves me, him my father will honor. Are you a witness for Christ? So the Lord is preparing Peter for, and he's preparing us for, graciously. Are you a witness for Christ? Do you evangelize? If you're not being faithful in preaching the gospel, is it because you're cowardly? Following Christ requires courage. It requires faith. It requires trust. Are you ashamed of him? Are you ashamed of his words? Fundamentally, it's a question of your love for him. Do you love? Do you love the Lord Jesus Christ? Wives, do you submit joyfully to your husband, even if they fail, right? Even if they, they're fallible men, even if they're lost, Peter would say. Husbands, do you sacrificially humble yourself to love your wife? It's, it's a humbling thing, isn't it? To sacrifice your own preferences, your own, it's humbling. Do you sacrificially humble yourself to love your wife, even in their weakness? Men, do you do that? No? Is your marriage in constant tension, consistent turmoil, a string of conflicts? Why don't you love the Lord Jesus Christ more? Why aren't you more involved in the life of this church? Do you love him? If you're still in rebellion to the Lord's commands, if you've never turned from your sin, if you've never committed yourself to him in doing good, committed yourself to him in all things, the Lord Jesus Christ commands you today, follow me. It's not going to be easy. He doesn't promise you easy. He doesn't promise you health and wealth and prosperity. It may cost you everything. But compelled, controlled by the love of Christ, you will gladly give it up. Counting whatever was once gained to you as rubbish as worthless to follow Christ because Christ is worthy. Amen? True love for Christ involves service. True love for Christ involves sacrifice. Point three on your notes. True love for Christ involves perseverance. Perseverance. Peter is to follow the Lord to the very end, faithful to his own calling. He's to persevere in faithful obedience regardless of what goes on around him. Okay, look at verse 20. Then Peter, turning around, he saw the disciple whom Jesus loved following, who also had leaned on his breast at the supper, and he said, Lord, who is the one who betrays you? Now we know from verse 24 that this is referring to the author of the gospel. This is John, okay? Verse 21, Peter, seeing him, seeing John, said to Jesus, but Lord, what about this man? You know, Peter's prognosis is going to end up in death. What about John? Peter's so easily distracted, isn't he? So are we. Peter now knows the cost of discipleship for him is going to be very high. So what about John, Lord? What's going to happen to him? Verse 22. Jesus said to him, none ya. <laughs> yeah, none ya business, Peter. <laughs> If I will that he remain till I come, what is that to you? You follow me. If I desire that he lives until I come back again, what concern is that of yours, Peter? Your responsibility, Peter, is to faithfully follow me, undeterred, undistracted by what does or does not happen around you, what does or does not happen to those people around you. Listen, brothers and sisters are going to come and go. Brothers and sisters are going to live and die. Some disciples are going to persevere with you. Others are going to depart from the faith. Some will love me, Peter. Others will prove by their actions that they hate me, Peter. The church may grow, and then there may be a church split, right? There'll be times of peace, and then times of great adversity, great difficulty, suffering. 
Even if all are made to stumble, Peter, remember Peter's boast earlier, right? Even if all are made to stumble, Peter, you follow me. You persevere in faithfulness to your calling. Long and steadfast, immovable obedience in the same direction over a long period of time until your death. That's what the Lord is calling for. Verse 23. And this saying went out among the brethren that this disciple would not die. <laughs> Yet Jesus did not say to him that he would not die, but he said, if I will that he remain till I come, what is that to you? And John takes care to clarify that. Concern for others at the expense of concern for faithfulness to the Lord has derailed many a professing Christian. Their friend leaves a biblical church. Maybe your friend gets disfellowshipped, is disfellowshipped from a biblical church. And they follow their friend rather than being faithful to Christ. Their friend is offended, and so they pick up their friend's offense. They follow their friend rather than being faithful to Christ. If you came here with someone, if you came here with someone, you better be prepared for that to get tested. What are you going to do? What are you going to do? They leave. What are you going to do? What is that to you, Jesus says? You follow me. Again, it's present active, present obedience, present faithfulness, ongoing obedience is to be Peter's and our primary and ongoing concern. Verse 24, this is the disciple who testifies of these things and wrote these things, and we know that his testimony is true. These things, referring not just to the content of chapter 21, but referring to the content of the whole gospel, the gospel of John. Verse 25, there also may, or there also, there are also many other things that Jesus did which if they were written one by one, I suppose that even the world itself could not contain the books that would be written. Amen. When you stop to think about verse 25, it's really no exaggeration, right? If you, if you think about it, this is Jesus, the eternal, eternal word who was in the beginning with God and who is God, the one who made all things all things were made by him. Without him, nothing was made that was made. He is the resurrection and the life. He is the one who conquered death and the grave. And so, if all his deeds were written, the world would be a very small library indeed, right? John's gospel is just simply a small part of the glory of the Son of God. It will be a, a glory that we preach to our deaths, Lord willing, by the grace of God, and that we will praise him for in heaven for all eternity. Written that you may believe that he is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. You know, having restored Peter on the beach, having exhorted us by Peter's example, having prepared Peter in the way that he did, prepared those men, and then entrusting them, right? We've gone through the Gospel of John, and that preparation has been good and glorious and helpful preparation to us. The Lord now entrusts Peter, in John chapter 21, and he entrusts us in our day, in our age, with a loving call to follow him. We are to be loving and faithful witnesses for the Lord Jesus Christ. We are to tend to one another. We are to love one another. We're to be a Loving, living, thriving, healthy, exhorting, encouraging part of the Lord's body together. A life of loving service, loving sacrifice, loving perseverance. If you look at the very next page, Acts chapter 1, Acts chapter 1, look at verse 4. Being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you have heard from me. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. 
Therefore, when they had come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, Nunya, <laughs> it is not for you to know the times or seasons which the Father has put in his own authority. In other words, you follow me. You follow me. Verse 8, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. He's not left us orphans as he promised. As he promised, he has come to us by his spirit. So do you love him? Do you love him? Has the love of God been poured out in your heart by the Holy Spirit who was given to us? He commands you today, follow me. He commands you today, follow me. He's prepared you. He's given you this revelation of himself, this glorious revelation. And now he turns to you and says, do you love me? Then follow me. Tend to my sheep. Preach the gospel, right? Follow me. What will you do? If you're here today and you don't know Christ, the Lord has given a rev revelation of himself in this gospel. It is a glorious revelation. It is a sufficient revelation revelation. It is a Christ-exalting revelation, and he's given it that you might believe that he is the Christ, the Son of God, and believing you might have life in his name. Will you turn from your sin? Will you stop it now and live for Christ? Will you entrust yourself to him? Will you commit yourself to him in doing good as to a faithful creator, which he is? What will you do? What will you do? All praise, honor, and glory to the one who is with us to the end of the age. Amen. Amen.